the 24th chapter. Glory, Glory to you, Lord. Lord. Jesus himself stood with the disciples and said to them, Peace be with you. They were startled and terrified and thought that they were seeing a ghost. He said to them, Why are you frightened and why do doubts arise in your hearts? Look at my hands and my feet. See that it is I myself. Touch me and see. For a ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see that I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and his feet. <clears throat> While in their joy they were disbelieving and still wondering, he said to them, Have you anything here to eat? They gave him a piece of broiled fish, and he took it and ate it in their presence. Then he said to them, These are my words that I spoke to you while I was still with you, that everything written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms must be fulfilled. Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures, and he said to them, Thus it is written, that the Messiah is to suffer and to rise from the dead on the third day, and that repentance and forgiveness of sins is to be proclaimed in his name to all nations, beginning from Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, Lord Christ. Christ. Please pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable and suitable in your sight, O oh God, our rock, our strength, and our Redeemer. Amen. Our text today is from the 24th chapter of Luke. It's Luke's final chapter. And in chapter 24, Luke describes the day of resurrection. It's a busy day. It begins with Mary Magdalene and her friends visiting the empty tomb, running back to tell the other disciples what they had not seen, that is, a full tomb. And then, of course, those disciples don't believe them. So Peter runs, and he checks it out himself, and he finds the tomb empty as well, and is amazed. Then Jesus meets Cleopas and his buddy as they're walking up to Emmaus seven miles from Jerusalem. And he teaches them all that has transpired was to fulfill the Scriptures. What the Scripture said about the Messiah. He breaks bread with them and they realize it's Jesus. And at that moment, he vanishes like a ghost. And Cleopas and his buddy, well, they run those seven miles back to Jerusalem to be with the other disciples, to tell them what they had just experienced. And then in our text today, surprise, Jesus shows up again, just appears like a ghost. There's no entrance through a door. You know, it's like an episode of Star Trek. He's just beamed up into that upper room where the disciples were gathered. And then things get even more interesting. There's a scene, I don't know if there's Harry Potter fans there, but there's a scene in the book Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets when Harry and his friends attend a party for ghosts. And at this party, there's a big feast table. It's covered with food. The food is rotted. It stinks. And the reason that the ghosts let this food get rancid and get smelly is because, well, they can't eat. So the best they can do is slither through this rancid food and smell it. It's the closest they can get to their food because ghosts cannot eat. And it seems that Luke doesn't think ghosts can eat either, nor can they be touched by human hands. So as Luke describes it, Jesus shows his wounds and he invites them to touch his scars. And then he eats some broiled fish in their presence. Jesus is showing them that he's the real deal. He's not a ghost. He is the resurrected Christ, fully embodied and present. He's present in his glorified body. He's not resuscitated. He has died and has risen again. Flesh and bone. And again, like he did on the road to Emmaus, he teaches about all the things that the scriptures had said about the Messiah and how they had been fulfilled with his life, his death, 
and His resurrection. And with His minds open, His resurrection proved that all that He had said was fulfilled. They finally understood that the Messiah must suffer, must die, and be raised again on the third day. And that repentance and forgiveness of sin is to be proclaimed in His name to all nations. Then Jesus tells them, you are witnesses of these things. You see, in Luke's Gospel, that phrase, this scene, is Jesus commissioning the disciples. It's a little different than what we read about in Matthew. But nevertheless, in Luke, it represents the completion of Jesus' earthly work. Because just a few short verses later, He ascends to His heavenly home. And as we reflect on Luke's resurrection day, we see Jesus bringing the entire gospel message home to His disciples. You know, He's taught them for three years. They followed Him around. He's been with them, a real presence. He's told them what would happen, but they didn't really understand it. And then in just one day, He ties it all up into a tidy package with a bow on top. Three times, Luke tells us about seeing and showing and presence, which shores up the disciples' role as witnesses to the resurrection. And so, we're left to wonder, just what did these witnesses do? Well, lots, actually. We learn in Acts, which Luke also wrote, that the Holy Spirit comes on Pentecost and empowers the believers to evangelize, to spread this gospel far and wide. Of course, they did. We're living proof of that right here today. 2,000 years later, the witness that Jesus commissioned continues. Here at Trinity, it began in 1917. Maybe some historians will tell me it started earlier than that when the chapel was built. But I mean, what I want you to focus on is every week in worship, we proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sin. We hear God's word. And then we receive Christ's real presence in the sacrament of the Holy Communion. And then we're sent out to be witnesses of all that we have experienced. Kind of makes me think about running. Got any runners here? Hey, Pastor Jen's a runner. In fact, Pastor Jen just, I don't know, a couple weeks ago ran a marathon. That's a, a long, that's a long distance. It's an incredible accomplishment. And if you're a long distance runner, well, I'll just say that I only run if I'm chased. <laughs> if I have to. <laughs> and yet running is an excellent metaphor to use when trying to understand our gospel lesson today. And not so much a marathon or an individual race, but a relay race. For me, I see it as a relay race. For many runners, we're on the same team. Some runners run faster than others, and some runners run straighter than others. Some runners vary their speed. They go fast and they slow down. Some runners bump into other runners. But all runners on the team have the same goal, getting the baton across the finish line. After all, it's not about the runner. It's about the baton. Because a relay race is meaningless unless the baton is successfully passed from one runner to the next. And a runner without the baton, well, they're just running. They're running in vain. Folks, it's all about the baton. And for us Christians, the baton is the gospel message. Yes, it's a PVC pipe. I get that. But work with me. Work with me. It's, it's a baton. So this baton, let's say it's the gospel message, if you will, is the good news of the life, the death and resurrection of Jesus the Christ changes everything. Jesus defeats death and brings life and immortality. And then, as we'll read in a few weeks, he sent the Holy Spirit to dwell within the believers gathered at Pentecost. God, as the Holy Spirit, empowers those early disciples and believers to spread this gospel message far and wide. And over the last 2,000 years, she has empowered many to proclaim repentance and forgiveness of sin in Jesus' name. It started with the apostles, early church leaders through Martin Luther and all the other reformers. And it extends right into our 
believing community here today. We here at Trinity have had some great runners in the Gospel Relay. I've heard stories about Pastor Croninger and Pastor Michael. The pastor of my home congregation who baptized me, Harold Winnick, was a son of Trinity. And of course, we've all benefited from the ministry of Pastor Bill and Pastor Jen. And I consider it a great privilege to know and learn from both of them on my internship here at Trinity. I've experienced the uniqueness of each's running technique, so to speak. But as great as they are as teachers and mentors, they're not as great as the baton they're handing off. Folks, the gospel relay is not meant to be a spectator sport. It's meant for all of us. There are plenty of gospel batons for everyone. In fact, your pastors have been preparing you since your baptism to advance the gospel baton throughout the human race in the witness of your life. At their core, pastors are coaches. They're equipping us to carry the baton. They hand it to us. They run the race with us. They fall down at times, just like us. They get lost sometimes, just like us. And yes, at some point, the race ends for each and every one of them. But the race continues. And it requires many runners. It requires teamwork. It requires mutual dependence and trust. It requires practice. The practice of eagerly learning, humbly receiving, and faithfully implementing what you've been taught, what you've been given. Trusting that the Holy Spirit will bring us fruit through our labors. Lord knows this world of ours needs to hear and experience all the good news that we can share by the witness of our daily lives, our lives of discipleship. So do your part to make it easy for those running the race now to pass on the baton to you. Allow them to run beside you and guide you, learning their technique. And by all means, open your hearts and your hands to take the baton from them and run with it. Or better yet, when it's dropped, get off the sidelines. Pick it up and run. After all, before too long, we'll all be passing the gospel of the tongue to somebody else. And now, my friends, may the peace that guides, the peace that surpasses all of our understanding, keep our hearts and our minds in Christ Jesus. Let all God's people say, Amen.